Now, without any further delay, let's begin today's event, once again sponsored by Looker and hosted by Information Management. It is my pleasure to introduce your moderator for today's session, and that is Jim Erickson, Editor Emeritus, Information Management. Jim, over to you. Thanks a lot, Jessica, and hello, everybody. Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are today, and uh, glad you could join us for our session today on Dashboards, Building Meaningful Ones. Meaningful dashboards. It's a great topic. Uh, some of you may know me as a longtime editorial director at Information Management and DM Review. And uh, nowadays I'm still doing some projects here, but working as a, uh, a primary uh, research market analyst in, in these fields that we covered in information management. And dashboards, visualizations, always at the top of our um, our, uh, our respondents' priorities in their technology initiatives related to business intelligence and uh, just making better decisions generally. So it's always a, a useful topic. Uh, I've seen it evolve over the years, and you know it's, it's very interesting some of the things talking about with today's presenters the, of where this space is moving. So I think it's going to be a really informative and, and useful uh, session today. So uh, asking you folks to please uh, take notes and, and ask some questions. I'll be doing the same, and we will reserve some time at the end for Q&A, so we'd love to hear what's on your mind. You're going to be hearing from two speakers today. First of all, uh, we're going to hear from Catherine Aurelio, who's the Director of User Experience at Looker. And uh, you'll also be hearing from, from Talal Asir, the field analytics manager at Looker. And they'll be sharing some of their uh, philosophical approach and also their, their technical approach and their uh, business approach to dashboards. So, again, we are recording this session, and we will send you a link to this presentation uh, when we have it available. There's also going to be a live demo uh, in this session, so we think you'll, you'll find that useful as well. So with that... I'm going to hand it off to Catherine Aurelio, who will get us started on our discussion today on building meaningful dashboards. Uh, Catherine, why don't you take it away? Thank you. Um, so, hello, everyone. My name is Catherine Aurelio, and um, I'm the Director of User Experience and Design at Looker, uh, as Jim mentioned, and I'm joined by uh, Talal Asir, who uh, does fantastic things for us uh, at Looker as, uh, as uh, one of our analytics managers. Um, so. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to get into this and uh, start talking about um, access. So uh, Talal and I will share uh, this particular slide, <clears throat> but I'll, I'll sort of get into a little bit of the history of Looker and then let Talal continue with that because he's Looker for much longer. It was originally designed to deliver a, an all-access path. Uh, to model data for anyone in an organization with permission to access it. And exploring data was the goal. So as such, our tool is sort of endlessly flexible. So this idea of granting users access to data is something that we're really familiar with. But what Looker has is kind of an abundance uh, problem, right? So what, what we're going to talk to you about today is how you can create a pathway through data. Um, and the, the problem is that even if people have full access, um, they might not have full context. And so I want to turn it over to Talal and let him talk to you a little bit more about, um, about Looker's past and, and uh, give you a little bit more context around how we've shaped um, this presentation to sort of present some useful ideas about how to construct meaningful dashboards. Great. Thanks, Catherine. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, just to give a quick um, you know, quick history lesson here on, on, on where Looker started is, you know, Looker's core technology has actually always been in having this, you know, centralized uh, data model. The idea is, you know, let's, uh, let's have one place where we defi define all of our business logic, and now let's enable our business users to be able to iterate on top of that business logic and be able to really explore the data and ask their own questions. Uh, and in fact, you know, we uh, didn't really have a, the, didn't really put a focus on the visualization aspect of that until about two years ago. Um, now, uh, you know, oftentimes people separate these, these two notions, right? You either have, uh, when you're looking at analytics, you either have, you know, your dashboards that you look at, or you have, uh, you know, you go and you do ad hoc analytics, um, where you're self-servicing and asking your own questions. Um, and really what we want to talk today about is, is being able to bridge that gap. And that's really what we're trying to enable through dashboards. Um, so dashboards can be a really powerful way, um, not only just to surface data to your users, but also to 
sort of guide them into aspects of your business and, and areas of your business that they can further explore in that, in that data model. Uh, and that's really what we're going to talk today, uh, about today is, you know, using dashboards as a, as a tool to guide users into, you know, being able to, you know, iterate on top of questions and to um, really explore the data further without being overwhelmed by, you know, a massive list of, of fields and measures and dimensions uh, and, and, and really providing them context to do that. Cool. So I think the question really here is uh, sort of how do you prevent your users from being lost in a data wilderness? <laughs> and, uh, and like I said, you know, this is a problem of abundance. As we all know, data is everywhere. And how you shape that data and how you help people find their way through it is incredibly important. Because if they get lost, um, they'll 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 do any number of things, none of them what you want um, as it relates to exploring the data or understanding it. Um, and so I'm going to sort of walk you through a, a, a kind of example around that. So if I showed you this, um, this sort of just looks like a very interesting pattern, and it doesn't mean much. And you have no idea what it means because you don't know if you're in it or not in it or anything. It just looks like an interesting pattern on a blue background. But if I start to add small pieces of information to it, like numbers, then you might start to get an idea of what you're looking at. And these, these numbers are, are actually elevations. So now you can understand that these are contour lines. And then if we add even more information to this, you can start to tell that there is a pathway through this space and that you have a certain place in that, on that pathway. Um, you can start to tell distances. You can start to tell um, you know, where you might be able to explore outside of the boundaries of you know, your particular trail. And that is the context that people require when they're trying to figure out their way um, through, uh, through data. And this is the kind of journey that we want to be able to, to create for users. So um, if you add in these contextual references through data, uh, you can figure out how to get from point A to point B. Um, and that's really important because it helps people make good decisions while they're in the data. Um, they don't get lost, and they don't actually create stuff that's incorrect, um, which is actually another problem that happens, right? You can make all sorts of incorrect assumptions if you don't know where you are, and it just gets you further lost. So uh, this is one thing, which is that dashboards are data maps. and. Um, as we talk more about this, sorry, those are dogs. Um, as we talk more about this, uh, we'll, we'll get into some examples that Talal is actually going to walk you through. Um, so we're going to start with some examples around what you might want to try and avoid and some common pitfalls and things that we see happen um, as it relates to dashboard creation. So from here, I'm going to let Talal take over again. Yeah, so uh, we figured we'd start off with uh, some examples of um, sort of what, what we've seen in the field uh, in terms of uh, common pitfalls um, and, and where, where this tends to break down and some assumptions that people make that, uh, you know, we really think could be improved on. Um, so if you take a look at this dashboard here, uh, I'm going to sort of walk through some points uh, that are on this dashboard um, that we see as, as these common pitfalls. And so, you know, at, at first glance, um, you know, you may think, you know, it looks pretty nice. There's some visualizations on there. It's got some numbers. Um, and, and really, I want to dive into a couple of different elements on here. Uh, and so starting off at sort of a high level, when you take a look at this dashboard, um, first of all, it's, it's, it's quite crowded, uh, and your eyes don't really know where to go first, right? You have this kind of like overload of information coming at you, and you don't even know, um, you know, what you're supposed to be getting at this, or what your what actions you're supposed to be taking. Um, so I'll start off on a couple of uh, of points of why we think that is. So if you take a look, if we start off here, let's say we start off on this first row, um, you know, of elements. You know, I've got I've got a bunch of different numbers here. Um, what you can tell is which of these numbers 
are related to each other and contextual and which are completely separate. Uh, so if you look at the, t the first three, for example, you know, new customers this week, new customers last week, and week over week, um, these numbers actually only really make sense when they're read together, right? They're providing context for each other, but I haven't done anything as a dashboard designer to actually uh, tell my audience that, you know, when you're reading this number, you should also read these two because that's what's really going to give you context and meaning to that number. Uh, and then I've got this number over here that's actually not not that helpful. It's sort of just its own number that, without any context. And it's also not meant to be read at the same level of hierarchy as the other three. Um, if we go down to the second row here, um, this is a really uh, common thing that we see as well. And, and essentially what we've got here is, you know, three different visualizations that are almost almost telling us the same thing. We've got orders by traffic source, orders by source over time, orders by source and gender. Um, and it's basically, you know, three different variations of me just exploring my orders uh, by their traffic source. Um, and really the reason I, I, I think that we see this so often is that whoever is designing this dashboard is trying to anticipate you know, every question that the end user might want to ask about orders and traffic source. And so they're splitting it over time and gender. Um, but the reality is, you know, it's, it's near impossible to really make that anticipation uh, ahead of time. And so, you know, really what you need is one of these dashboards or one of these dashboard elements um, that the user can sort of start off and decide, all right, you know what, I want to know more about my orders and my traffic source. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to explore that further and I'm going to iterate on those questions and really start to ask more questions. And I'll get into examples of that um, later in the presentation. Um, if, we keep, if we keep going here, um, another uh, common thing that we see is kind of this, um, uh, what we call sort of like a just-in-case uh, example, which is, you know, I'm going to put on all these columns on this table just in case the user cares about it. And this, again, comes back to that notion of trying to get ahead of, you know, additional columns that a user might ask for or information they might want to see. Um, so, in, you know, a general rule of thumb is if you find yourself scrolling within a visualization, uh, either right to left or up and down, um, there's probably too much information on that. So, um, really, I mean, we're looking at about 14 or 15 different columns, and, and the human brain is really just not built to consume information this way. So it's very difficult for me to look at this, this table here and either understand something about my business or be driven to some kind of action from this. Um, and if really what I want is to be able to see all my orders, there are better ways to do that that, that will add context and that will actually show me um, you know, the orders that I care about and assign some level of priority to them. Um, so uh, if we continue to scroll down here and I'll go down to the bottom, uh, this last example is, is, you know, what we call dashboard decoration, right? It's essentially, a, you know, maybe a nice looking chart, uh, but there's so many data points on here uh, and it's, it really becomes almost meaningless because, again, I can't look at nine different charts divided by five different categories and actually consume any kind of information out of this. Again, that's going to lead me to some kind of analytic conclusion uh, or drive towards some kind of action. Um, and so, uh, you know, down, right when we get to the end of the presentation here, we're going to go through some examples of dashboards that, um, you know, provide a little bit more context um, uh, so that you can really uh, – so that you can really like expose these these dashboards in a way that you know factors in who's going to be looking at them and what you actually want them to do with them. Awesome. So let's talk about this. We we sort of uh, looked at all of the examples that. Uh, that Talal just showed you and actually took uh, a lot of feedback from, from, uh, from people and looked at a lot of dashboards in order to come up with um, some of the things that, that we thought might be good examples of um, things to consider as you, as you uh, construct your dashboards. And so really it doesn't take too many steps to create a great dashboard experience. So we thought what we would try and do is to break down those steps um, into into a couple of really useful um, ideas, and so we've narrowed it down to 
four essential points. And Talal is actually going to take you through the first one, um, which is which is about audience, and then we'll go from there. Yeah. So let's go ahead. Sorry, let me switch to the next slide here. Um, so the first thing that you before you really get into the design, um, the really the first question you want to ask yourself is, you know, what is the purpose of this dashboard that I'm created? What what do I want people to do with this dashboard? And uh, we're, we're going to give some examples here of three different types of dashboards, the three different purposes that you can build a dashboard for. Um, so the first one is this notion of a high level or an executive dashboard, right? It, this is the, the dashboard that basically um, has really important numbers on it. You know, it's, it's your key performance indicators. It's the metrics that drive your business, um, but they're not very fast changing numbers. Right, so these are numbers like you know your revenue or um, you know year over year growth, things like that, um, that you may check on maybe a daily basis or a weekly basis, um, but there isn't a, a ton of action to take directly from them. It's more of a, a health check on your business. So again, really important dashboards, uh, a really important type of dashboard, um, but not really one that lends itself to um, a ton of interactivity or a ton of sort of action driven. Um, orientation. And so um, it's important to understand when you're creating that dashboard and who the audience is for so that you're not kind of like mixing and matching things that need immediate action with numbers that are not going to really change uh, on a daily or, or an hourly basis. Um, the other type of dashboard uh, we want to talk about here is your analytical dashboard. So the point of your analytical dashboard um, is going to be to rather than answer uh, a lot of questions is to provide an entry point into different uh, parts of your data model that the user can explore. So these can be things like, you know, let's say you built into your data model an area for users to explore product affinity analysis, you know, uh, market, uh, market uh, basket analysis. I want to know what orders um, uh, customers are purchasing, what products they're purchasing with other products. There can be a million questions that come off of that. So rather than trying to answer those all through the dashboard, I can have one or two elements of my dashboard sort of guide me into that exact um, you know, part of my model that's going to have the right measures and dimensions on it, and now I can start playing around with it. Um, so the idea of behind an analytical dashboard is not to answer questions, but rather to generate questions uh, and guide people into the right place uh, in your data model. Um, and the last one we'll talk about here are operational dashboards. Uh, and so operational dashboards um, are really meant to be uh, driving action, right? So you can think of these as almost like alerts. Uh, you know, if you look at, uh, if, you, if you've built an operational dashboard, you should be able to look at that and say, here's what I need to do right now. And, and it should give you the priority of what you need to do uh, and the ability to actually take direct action from where you are. Um, and so uh, in, in a bit here, we'll, we'll go through a couple of examples of each of these and talk about some characteristics that would define each of them. Yeah, so let's talk about the next point, um, which is uh, reducing cognitive load. So what does that mean? So the reduction of cognitive load, um, Talal touched on this on the, uh, on the last slide where he was talking about uh, really trying to narrow down the audience that you want to reach. That's a part of reduction of, of cognitive load, knowing who you want to talk to. The next thing really is about being able to orient yourself. Where are you in space? Um, that's really important. So I should be able to look at a dashboard and understand what's on it very, very quickly. This is akin to any other thing that you, that you do when you're searching the web, when you're looking at a magazine, when you're doing anything. This is a big part of user experience is like, where am I in the world and what am I looking at. So whoever your audience is should be able to come to the dashboard and understand its purpose and what they're meant to get out of it very, very quickly. If they don't, you will end up finding that they, they either leave or they'll have problems in terms of how they interpret the data and what they do with it. Um, the other thing that we see a lot is people trying to put together very complex uh, visualizations that are trying to speak to a lot of different audiences. And so as a result of trying to put together that one visualization fits all people notion, needing to write paragraphs 
in order to explain the visualization. And that's not very useful either because you're taking people's attention away from the thing that you're trying to show them to trying to explain what that thing is. So if you find yourself needing to write descriptive text about what a visualization is, you're trying to address too many audience types with that visualization. You might want to narrow down the, the narrative that you're trying to explain. Uh, and then also with that, titling of your dashboard elements is really important. Um, what is this visualization and what is it trying to show? And then leave it at that. Uh, your, your title should be pretty short. Um, and then the other thing is visualization types that are easy to parse. So should not be overly complex. Uh, they, they should be fairly easy to understand. Maybe they have two or three like compressed visual uh, components. In other words, you, you, you might have something that has like 12 series in it, but you might only need to say two or three things with that compressed thing. And so you want to try and make sure that your visual, visualization types are easy to parse um, because as Talal showed you on, on his example dashboard, you know, there, we see a lot of times where people create visualizations that are very pretty to look at, but that people can't possibly understand. Um, and then the last thing I'll say here is that white space is incredibly refreshing. <laughs> so you don't have to make a dashboard that has 45 tiles on it. In fact, less is more in a lot of cases. So you want to try and make dashboards that are really, really to the message that you're trying to deliver. And you might actually uh, consider having either single looks that are telling a story, or you might have dashboards that really only have, you know, two or four tiles on them and have dashboards as opposed to one that's just like this big, long, mega, mega dashboard. And so all of those points, when you think about them together, is this concept of reduction of cost. Reduction actually really helps people to where they are in space and time as it relates to data. Um, and so uh, Talal is going to talk about this, this next idea, and uh, so I'll turn it over to him. Yeah, and, and this is, these are all obviously very, very closely related. And, um, you know, when Catherine's talking about these, these kind of like giant dashboards that we t tend to see that are just kind of this endless scroll, one of the big reasons that we see those is, you know, it, almost like, you know, uh, this, this desire to uh, centralize everything into a single dashboard. Um, so, you know, I'm going to have a section for my sales team and my marketing team and my operation team. And I'm just going to split them up into different sections in the same dashboard. Um, but when you do that, you're basically uh, creating the need for the user or the audience that, that's reading that dash, uh, dashboard to look at each element and decide whether or not it's important to them. It's basically adding this cognitive cost um, to the audience when uh, really they probably only care about a very small portion of it. And so um, it's kind of like knowing your audience in the sense of like, yeah, who am I building this for? We talked about the purpose of it. Um, but there's also this concept of um, the 85% rule or the 85-15 rule or the 80-20 rule where um, – you know, understanding 80% um, of the most critical needs uh, of a user or of your audience and being able to build a dashboard towards that um, is really where you want to be because you sort of start to hit this point after that of diminishing returns where, yeah, maybe they want to see this, this one or that one or a couple more visualizations or elements on that dashboard. But as you add more and more, again, I'm getting less and less value out of each added thing because of the cost that's being added um, to my dashboard and because of the, the need that's being created for me to now process each one of these visualizations and figure out which one of them I care about and which ones I don't. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, the, the reason behind that is, is typically, you know, comes out of requests to, oh, can you add this, can you add that, and, and, and things like that, Where, whereas really you want to ask yourself every time, every time before you're going to add a new element to your dashboard, you want to ask yourself, you know, is this worth that cognitive load aspect to my audience right now? Does this audience really care, do 85% of my audience really care about this new element that I'm going to put on? Or does it need to live in its own, you know, 
process or its own visualization, maybe a separate dashboard that I can link to or that I can navigate to from the context of this one, but probably doesn't belong in my in my 85% group. So I think Archer, what we're going to do now is is just hop into a couple of uh, a couple of examples of what we've been talking about here. Um, you know, which is you know we saw we saw the example of kind of like the uh, the common pitfalls. Uh, but we also want to talk about examples of, of like these different dashboard types and purposes and, and you know, what, what makes up each one of them. Um, so we'll start off with this uh, executive dashboard. Now, you know, again, we talked about this executive dashboard being the type of dashboard that is going to have your key performance indicators like, you know, new customers and revenue. Um, and again, this is the type of dashboard I'm going to come to once a week or once a month. These numbers aren't, aren't very fast changing, but they are very important. Um, but um, what's really important about surfacing these numbers is providing context, right? So if I'm just looking at this number by itself, 15,239, unless I'm someone who already has memorized our, you know, uh, our business model and is very intimately familiar, that number doesn't mean a whole lot to me. Um, and so adding indicators uh, or, or context to those is really important. So uh, in this case, we're adding um, a, a benchmark basically. Well, okay, 15,000 new cu customers, is that good? Well, it is, it sounds like a big number, but it's actually 14% down from last year. So now that really helps me understand this number a little bit more. Um, you know, revenue tracking, you know, the revenue number on its own is one thing, but what really helps is me providing some kind of uh, metric here that tells me, okay, well, how is this tracking against my goal? Am I, am I happy with this? And if we look down, we see the same kind of thing in visualizations where, um, you know, uh, looking at how we performed over the year on its own is one thing, but it's, it's even better if I'm looking at how it compared to previous years. Uh, or in this case, this is actually one of my favorite visualizations, is it's actually looking at um, individual quarters um, and how those quarters performed as the quarter progressed, basically. So if I'm on, you know, the 48th day of my quarter, I can tell I'm at 60% of my uh, goal. So that's one benchmark. And the other benchmark is telling me, all right, well, what percentage have I typically in across other quarters? Um, and, you know, really, are we in a good place right now? Is it typically linear? Uh, it's giving me a lot of context for me to really be able to understand, well, am I happy right now or am I not, basically? Um, the other dashboard type we talked about is this analytical dashboard. And so in this case, you know, again, my dashboard here is, is, gonna, is not going to be entirely um, helpful on its own in the sense that I'm not going to learn a lot by looking at this. I'm going to learn some high level information like, you know, I've got this web session funnel, I've got this affinity analysis. Um, and really these are super high level um, visualizations, but what they do is they provide me a way to now jump into a particular area of my business, whether it's, you know, affinity analysis, repeat purchase rates, common shipping locations. Uh, and really start to explore that and, and ask more questions. So I can take this visualization, for example, and I'm going to go ahead and explore this visualization um, in a separate tab. That's going to bring me into this explore section where I can now start to ask more questions on this. So I can say, well, you know what? I don't want the last seven days. I want the last 90 days. And I actually want to look at um, this funnel by the traffic source. Uh, and again, it's that common scenario that we see every day, which is one question always leads to another. So rather than having a, you know, uh, funnel by traffic source and a funnel by gender and all of those different elements on my dashboard, I provided that entry point through this high level visualization. And then the user can now come into this sort of uh, interactive interface and really start to ask the questions that they care about. Um, and then the last one here, you know, kind of built these like mini little dashboard examples, but the last one here is really meant to um, uh, be an operational dashboard. So this is sort of my uh, high level, what do I need to do right now uh, example. So uh, in this first example, um, you know, it's things like open orders greater than three days old, right? And so 
that's a really important thing to track. I really want to understand if I have an open order, I've decided more than three days old means I need to take action on it. Um, but rather than just listing out every single one of those orders, we've actually created um, you know, different buckets here that I can drill into and, and, and this gives me some level of priority. So I know, let's say I know historically that um, you know, the first week of a customer's life cycle is the most important one. If we send them a late order, you know, they're probably never going to come back again. That means this first group here is my most important one. So I can drill into that. I can get down to the row level element. And this is where row level detail is really helpful is when it has context. Uh, and I can actually take action directly from here. I can go to the user lookup dashboard. I could email the user directly from um, Looker, or I could link to, for example, you know, if I've got six open tickets here in my Zendesk, I know I don't like open tickets. I want to close them. You can actually link directly to external tools like Zendesk or whatever and be able to take action directly from uh, that dashboard. Um, and so this is really you know, where having role level detail can be very powerful is when it has, uh, uh, it has context, it has priority, and really the point of getting to a role level is to be able to now take action on an individual uh, event or, or a transaction. Yeah, that's, these are great points and great examples because they're really pulling together the first three points that we made and uh, kind of explaining how to make sure that you're addressing uh, your audience in the right way um, and really just honing in on the purpose that, uh, that, that the dashboard needs to convey and, and also really starting to create the journey for people. Um, and so, Maybe what we can do now is to move into uh, a few more kinds of examples, and then we'll get to the last step. Um, and so this slide really is about um, other ways that we can start to think about dashboarding, maybe potentially even outside of the application itself. So we have examples like embedded examples. Um, and the next slide actually is a Salesforce um, embedded uh, example where we're sort of showing a landing page for, um, for a Salesforce instance. And this can be really useful for people who are coming into a situation and uh, just need to get a basic overview of what they maybe need to do or information that they need to see, sales goals that they're getting near or how far away they are from them or uh, you know, their, their win rate. Um, and so this just kind of gives people a little bit of an orienting sort of uh, place to start, if you will, when they enter, uh, when they enter an, an application like Salesforce. And so this is a good example of, of an embedded instance where you're, you're able to see uh, a, a general overview. And this is something that actually can work for a large audience group. And so we've talked a lot about the idea of narrowing your focus, but there's also this possibility to create dashboards that are really, um, they really sort of end up being executive type dashboards that, um, that Talal was talking about early on. And what those are doing is essentially like, it's like the weather forecast for <laughs> <laughs> for your data. Like, is it sunny? Yes, it's sunny. Is it cloudy? Yes, it's cloudy. And then you can move from there as opposed to being very specific. And so uh, this kind of dashboard actually really sort of sets the expectation about what a large group of people might need to do. But the creator of this dashboard actually thought about like, well, what's the purpose? The purpose is to give people an overview. Um, the other, actually, I'll ask Talal if you, do you have anything to add to this uh, to this example, Talal? Uh, no, not a, not a ton. You know, I think what I really like about this example is that um, going back to the notion of context, uh, it's it obviously it, it's by definition it has context because the data is living now and this dashboard is living uh, in the environment that the user's already in. So rather than you know, them having to go outside of uh, into another tool or whatever, they can be provided context within 
some other uh, you know interface that that they're dealing with. And so Salesforce Salesforce is a really common example. You know, you're looking at a certain account page, you're looking at a certain opportunity page. Rather than logging into a separate tool to now look up that account or that opportunity, this is a really um, you know a really powerful way to provide insights to that particular account based on exactly you know the page that you're looking at or you know the opportunity that you, that you're currently looking at. Yeah, so uh, I think we can actually move on to our our next example as well, which is um, an example that uh, we created internally, um, and Talal will actually share his screen. There's a slide for this that was just a placeholder, and then Talal actually has the the live example that he can share. Um, but while he's pulling that up, I'll start to sort of give the intro of it. So uh, internally at Liquor, we did this, um, we just had this sort of, idea that we wanted to use some census data and see what we could pull out of it. And we gave ourselves a really, really short time frame to do this work. We said, well, what, what, what could we maybe do in a week? And, you know, you might say to yourself, well, you guys are, this is like your business, so of course you can do it very fast. But the truth is, is that part, partly what we were trying to do is like test whether or not this was actually possible. Like, can we actually pull together an interesting, like interesting model data that we can then start to explore create some insights from, and then post those things in like outside of Looker for people to, to, to look at. And so we found this like little filter uh, that you can see on the left, which is a map. And so we just sort of wired that into a, a very, very simple um, site that we created uh, that would allow you to filter on state. And we've changed this census site actually a few different times. Now it's looking at education. And at one point it was looking at, uh, at voter statistics. Um, and, and it changes every once in a while. So, so when we find new little insights, we'll post them up on the site and then the map just stays the same. So it's always filtering on state um, and time. And so you can just change these little filters around and then click the go button and it'll run uh, the information and then you've, you've got this ability to share. And so it's just creating a very, very simple little interaction uh, for people to see and, uh, and, and start to think about. Um, and they can share that information on Facebook or on Twitter. And so it's just another way that, that you can start to think about creating these data journeys for people not necessarily inside of Looker. Um, so this is using the API and having it live outside of Looker, which is which is another way to do it. Um, and with that, I think we can actually move on to our uh, final slide and uh, talk about the last step. So some of you may have been wondering, like, hey, there, you only showed us three steps. Where's the fourth step? <laughs> so here's the fourth step. Uh, the fourth step is really... Uh, about the idea of this being a journey and, and not a destination. Um, you know, it, it's really hard to find uh, patterns that people can, can use and reuse when you're creating dashboards, but it's also super, super important. Um, you know, Talal and I have talked a lot about trying to hone in on the specifics of your audience, the specific uh, points of like the kinds of dashboards that you want to create and why and and getting the hang of creating effective dashboards is is certainly not rocket science but there is a time consuming element to creating meaningful experiences and there's also this piece where you as the creator of the dashboard kind of have to stay true to your own vision of like why you created the dashboard in the first place um, because one of the things that we see a lot is that uh, people will take a lot of time to think through how they want to create the dashboard and who they want to create the dashboard for. And then you'll have people from within your own organization that will come and say, you know what, I would really love to see a tile that showed me this on that dashboard that you just released to, to the company. And, um, you know, whatever it is, it doesn't necessarily go with the rest of the information and you find yourself going, oh, okay, well, great, I'll add that. And then, you know, over time, you end up with dashboards. We have them internally, and this happens all the time. Um, you end up with dashboards that have like 40 tiles on them that are, that are actually, you know, sing, the singular tiles are like focused for one person's need or, or a few people's needs, and then those people are just like 
basically scrolling to that one tile and looking at it. And so I think what we're trying to ask you to do is to stay strong to your own vision of why you created the dashboard in the first place and start to think about like, okay, this, these people need some kind of different experience. Why? How can I create that experience for them either within this context because it addresses the 80% use case or outside of this context because it addresses 80% of their use case? Or if you create a dashboard, sometimes you, you know, one of the things that we have to do a lot is to go back to the original audience and say, like, is this dashboard meeting your needs? Like, are you able to use it uh, on a day-to-day -day basis to gain insight and do your jobs better? Like, is it helping you? And if it's not, yeah. how can we change it so that it does? Yeah, and in, and in talking about that journey to, to creating a dashboard, I think that that is a really important aspect here is um, a lot of times what we see is, is people creating um, – creating dashboards that are meant to be shared uh, and are meant to be shared across a team or an organization, uh, and they're creating them in a vacuum in, in the sense that, you know, they're, they're anticipating, again, everything that the business might need and putting it on a dashboard as opposed to starting with absolutely uh, the bare minimum. Uh, and this is, this is a, an approach that I, that I definitely recommend, which is, Start, start with what you know everybody really cares about, right? The, the, the really high critical ones um, and, and put it out there. You know, it's not necessary to create a completely finished, polished, 100% product because it's almost impossible to get that right on the first try. And so I would definitely recommend, you know, as you're taking this journey, have those conversations with those audience before you start the design process. Um, really understand what what actions they want to take or what, you know, uh, insights they're, they're really looking for uh, before you go down the path of creating a dashboard. Um, and then start with those really high critical ones and see, you know, how, how their needs evolve basically as they start having more and more exposure to that data. Absolutely. I think that's a, actually a great way for us to wrap things up and, uh, and, and get to some questions and discussion uh, with with our audience and our moderator. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, great. Yeah. It was really interesting stuff. I, I got a lot out of this session so far. And and to me, it's a really strong update on, on the dashboard space. Um, you know, coming from sort of a push-down kind of mentality of dashboards, this guy is a – he, he has this role, so he, he's going to get this. And this, you know, is about policies and, and, uh, and controls. And this, I see the tension in what you guys are talking about here because at the same time, you're creating a dashboard for everyone. You're creating a dashboard for anyone. <laughs> so um, the, the issue of, of I'm sure as, as, a, as a UX, you know, director, Catherine, this is, this is a central issue for you. It probably keeps you up at night sometimes. Uh, how do you, yeah. when you, when you give people that much control uh, over their own views and, and context, how do you manage that tension between uh, cognitive overload and, uh, you know, just, just too much information? Well, that's a great question. And, uh, and I, I, like I said in the very beginning, I think um, having a problem of abundance is, uh, is actually much better than trying to, like, create journeys through uh, you know, things that aren't that interesting to look at to start. Right. <laughs> so, oh, right. Exactly. Uh, right? So, so, for the times. Yeah, sure. yeah, exactly. So what, so that map that I showed is actually just a really great, uh, I think for, for what we're dealing with as it relates to lots and lots of information that really just finding the place where you want to, to start, like what is, what is your orientation space and how are you going to create boundaries around it? Those boundaries don't need to be visible boundaries. They just need to be present. And as long as they are present, then you can, you can guide people into being able to have insights and, and actually they'll come back to you less like with more with questions right so you'll start to enable them to through these journeys to 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 gain insights that are actually useful and meaningful for them um, so that they're not coming back to you with a bunch of questions that they could answer if they just understood the data better right. um, and so that's one of the things that like 
it's one of the great things about Looker is that we have this, like, it's just endless. It's like, it's like the whole earth, but in order to understand the whole earth, you have to map it. You have to know the distances between things. And so we're giving you everything. Um, but then what we're trying to do with these kinds of sessions is help people understand just like how to take like all of the earth and then just create it into an area map for a certain, you know, for a certain tour group, if you will. Right, right. Um, so it's a huge challenge, uh, uh, but we find that helping people figure out this kind of relationship, who they need to talk to, is one of the ways that we handle it. Right, and this fourth step really seems, you know, like the last mile of this. You talk about patterns and reuse and good user relationships. Now, in practice with your customers, is this something that the end user always creates, or is there some guidance, or is there are there are there you know uh, best practices for this that that would apply to a given person? Yeah, you know, I can. I can. Take oh, that yeah. One. Go ahead. I was just going to say, Talal is great for this one. <laughs> yeah. So. I, I think, you know, in, in more of the traditional sort of top-down approach that you were describing earlier, Jim, is uh, the reason that, that people will, will almost try to reduce the number of dashboards that they have is because you are kind of, within each dashboard, defining certain business metrics and, and certain, you know, transformations and, and your business logic within the context of the dashboard itself. Um, so that creates a really big maintenance cost when, say, you know, I have to go update my uh, business logic. Now I'm going to have to go to all those 15 or 16 different dashboards that I created. Um, right. The way that the way that Looker addresses this is we actually put that um, we put th that fence uh, within the data model itself. So the data model is your single source of truth, and from that you can kind of um, you know create uh, visualizations, create dashboards. Um, that are either departmentally specific or even an individual uh, specific to an individual. Um, but the, you know uh, that centralized business logic is going to live within the data model. So if I decide I have to update my logic, I'm going to make that update in my model, and it's going to surface through all of these different dashboards that are created. So you don't have this notion of kind of chaos where everyone's built built in their own uh, logic and their own world. That's great, because I was going to ask you, because right at the beginning of the session today, you talked about a central data model, and, and I was going to ask you what that meant uh, <laughs> for customers specifically and what you meant by that. Yeah, So, yeah, and, and really really, what it comes down to is, um, you know, as, uh, as you're building these dashboards, people are all using that same set of tools, right, that same central set of dimensions, measures, uh, all of that business logic, but they can contextualize them in different ways, and that's really um, where having those split out and, and specific dashboards really makes sense. And so, so when you from this data model, do, do you like selectively expose data for for the the audience of users all the way across the board, or specific users? Yeah, that's that's a good question. We we've seen a lot of. Uh, uh, you know, variants on the way that organizations choose to do that. Um, the way that, you know, what, what our philosophy really is more about, you know, more data exposure is better. And so if you're restricting data, it shouldn't be, you know, it, it makes sense to, you know, restrict data for security purposes. But having more access to data, uh, we think, is always better. Um, but that, that's, where, that's really what, what's at the root of all of this is, you know, having a lot of access data is great, but it can be very overwhelming and almost mm -hmm. counterproductive if that data doesn't have context and if I don't have um, really easy ways to get to the data that I really care about and to ask the questions that I really want to ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, the, 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 that sales analytics module you, you demoed for us, you showed us, that was really good. I mean, and I got the context of that, and I got the purposefulness of it. Um, now, how does something like that update? Does it, does it update automatically, or is it, how, how does it refresh and so forth? Yeah, so, so um, Looker's architecture is basically a, a direct-to-database connection. And so um, that data model that, we're, that we've been talking about, it's really a virtual data model, right? It's describing all of your business logic and all the different components of it. But those things are happening, you know, at runtime. And so basically those dashboards are going to be as live as, as the data uh, that lives in your database. 
Right. Now, Catherine, you know, when you're talking about with this initial question I asked about the, the, the battle between overload and, and, you know, interest, I think is really central to, to markets today. And I, I think it really gets to the point of having really motivated end users instead of trying to get people to adopt something that they don't really get a lot of utility from. People have things on their desk for a reason. <laughs> the phone's yeah. there for a reason. <laughs> the mouse is there for a reason. The dashboard needs to be there for a reason. And it has to it has to really speak to the uh, the user's interest, right? And not just uh, not just because you need a stapler. That's right. Uh, that's actually a really great way to put it because the stapler has a, a very specific purpose, and so should a dashboard. Um, you know, it should, in some ways, just inform what your next step should be. Otherwise, it's not useful, and people will stop looking at them. If the dashboard is the same every day and nothing ever changes and there's no next action, then it's really hard to figure out how to use it, and people right. will just stop looking at it. Likewise, you, if – oh, go ahead. No, I, I was going to say that, uh, go, go finish your point, but I was going to ask if this you know, kind of messaging falls to some kind of evangelist in your groups or how you spread the word on this stuff with your customers. Well, yeah. they, actually – oh, go ahead. Sorry, Talal, what were you going to yeah. Well, oh, yeah, I, jump in there. I, I, at the end of the day, really, uh, when when we are talking to you know uh, people who are interested in Looker, what, what we talk to them about is really more on a data data approach and a data philosophy, and that's really at the end of the day what what Looker is is uh, bringing is you know it's it's not sort of just another version of some of the visualization tools and. Uh, you know, uh, dashboarding tools that are out there, it is very much a different approach on analytics and, and BI. And so typically we, we like to focus the conversation less on, you know, features and um, specific uh, visualizations and stuff and really like to contextualize this philosophy and, um, and talk about, you know, here's a different approach on data. You know, what if, what if dashboards weren't meant to be your endpoint or your, you know, your, uh, your delivery but rather meant to be a starting point or an entry point into really being able to ask your own questions. Yeah, right. Okay, last yeah, I, I, Go ahead, Catherine. Oh, ahead. I just wanted to add one piece to that, and, and that would be, I think, that uh, our tool is really quite a lot about enablement. Um, and, uh, you know, Talal has touched on this a number of different times, uh, and, and I think that's maybe the, one of the most succinct ways to explain it is that what we're trying to do is sort of enable and empower people to explore data and have access to it in in curated ways. And there's a ton of control and flexibility um, in that with Looker. Um, and so, you know, rather than focusing on like what is like what's the the end point of um of usage we're actually fo focusing focused on what is the starting point of usage right right you said a great word in there curated catherine i want <laughs> i hope yeah. everybody out in our audience remembers that uh, catherine <laughs> i know you're a you're a director of user experience i can kind of get my arms around that last thing talal your 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 title here is a field analytics manager can you tell me real briefly what that is it's interesting yeah, so it's um, essentially, uh, you know, me and, and my team are um, working with people who um, are not really Looker customers yet. So we're basically introducing them to this new approach and to, this, and to the product. And so um, it, it really is kind of like it sounds. We're doing a lot of field analytics. You know, the way that, that we, we found that people generate interest in Looker is, not necessarily by us talking about all the different features, but by us actually working directly with them. You know, we'll do, you know, uh, you know, one or two weeks where we'll connect directly to your uh, data environment and say, here's some, here's a new approach on data, and here's some really powerful analytics that solve some pains that, that you're commonly feeling. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're basically selling the, uh, the yeah. analytics piece of it. Um, you know, it's, it's, here's, here's a powerful analytics that you can now do rather than, you know, here, here are the, the bells and whistles of the product. 
Right. Okay, great. Well, thanks. That's really interesting. We're going to leave it there. Um, you know, to me, this is a, it was a really good discussion because it talks about that last, you know, 24 inches between the screen and your eyes. And you see how consumers have, have uh, addicted themselves to their own creations. And so it seems like a natural extension to the dashboard space rather than that traditional push down approach. It seems just like a logical place to go. So um, I really appreciate the, the chat today, some of the challenges and some of the future questions. I hope you'll follow up with uh, any questions you have, we'll be happy to answer them. I want to thank um, our speakers today. Catherine Aurelio is the Director of User Experience at Looker and Talal Asir, uh, Field Analytics Manager at Looker also, for a really interesting discussion on, on building better dashboards today. I, could, I get the point. So my name is Jim Erickson for Information Management. I want to thank everybody for your time and attention today, and we'll have, offer a replay for this as soon as we have it. So with that, I'll say thanks, everybody, for your time and attention. So long, and have a great week. Thank you.